In ordinary language, the term crime denotes an unlawful act punishable by a state. The term crime does not, in modern criminal law, have any simple and universally accepted definition. Though statutory definitions have been provided for certain purposes, the most popular view is that crime is a category created by law. In other words, something is a crime if declared as such by the relevant and applicable law. One proposed definition is that a crime or offense is an act harmful not only to some individual or individuals but also to a community, society or the state. Such acts are forbidden and punishable by law. The notion that acts such as murder, rape and theft are to be prohibited exists worldwide. What precisely is a criminal offense is defined by criminal law of each country. While many have a catalogue of crimes called the criminal code, in some common law countries no such comprehensive statute exists. The state has the power to severely restrict one's liberty for committing a crime. In modern societies, there are procedures to which investigations and trials must adhere. If found guilty, an offender may be sentenced to a form of reparation, such as a community sentence, or, depending on the nature of their offense, to undergo imprisonment, light imprisonment or, in some jurisdictions, execution, usually, to be classified as a crime. The act of doing something criminal must, with certain exceptions, be accompanied by the intention to do something criminal. While every crime violates the law, not every violation of the law counts as a crime. Breaches of private law are not automatically punished by the state, but can be enforced through civil procedure. Overview. When informal relationships and sanctions prove insufficient to establish and maintain a desired social order, a government or a state may impose more formalized or stricter systems of social control, with institutional and legal machinery at their disposal. Agents of the state can compel populations to conform to codes and can opt to punish or attempt to reform those who do not conform. Authorities employ various mechanisms to regulate certain behaviors in general. Governing or administering agencies may for example codify rules into laws, police citizens and visitors to ensure that they comply with those laws, and implement other policies and practices that legislators or administrators have prescribed with the aim of discouraging or preventing crime. In addition, authorities provide remedies and sanctions, and collectively these constitute a criminal justice system. Legal sanctions vary widely in their severity. They may include incarceration of temporary character aimed at reforming the convict. Some jurisdictions have penal codes written to inflict permanent harsh punishments, legal mutilation, capital punishment or life without parole. Usually a natural person perpetrates a crime, but legal persons may also commit crimes. Conversely, at least under U.S. law, non-persons such as animals cannot commit crimes. The sociologist Richard Quinney has written about the relationship between society and crime. When Quinney states, crime is a social phenomenon, he envisages both how individuals conceive crime and how populations perceive it, based on societal norms. Etymology The word crime is derived from the Latin root cerno, meaning, I decide, I give judgment. Originally the Latin word crimine meant charge or cry of distress, the ancient Greek word crimas from which the Latin cognate derives, typically referred to an intellectual mistake or an offense against the community, rather than a private or moral wrong. In 13th century English crime meant sinfulness, according to etymonline.com. It was probably brought to England as Old French crimna, from Latin crimine. In Latin, crimine could have signified any one of the following. Charge, indictment, accusation, crime, fault, offense. The word may derive from the Latin cerna, to decide, to sift. But Ernest Klein rejects this and suggests asterisk crimen, which originally would have meant cry of distress. Thomas G. Tucker suggests a root in cry words and refers to English plaint, plaintiff, and so on. The meaning offense punishable by law dates from the late 14th century. 
The Latin word is glossed in Old English by facen, also, deceit, fraud, treachery, cf. fake. Crime wave is first attested in 1893 in American English. Definition. England and Wales whether a given act or omission constitutes a crime does not depend on the nature of that act or omission. It depends on the nature of the legal consequences that may follow it. An act or omission is a crime if it is capable of being followed by what are called criminal proceedings. History The following definition of crime was provided by the Prevention of Crimes Act 1871 and applied for the purposes of Section 10 of the Prevention of Crime Act 1908. The expression crime means, in England and Ireland, any felony or the offence of uttering false or counterfeit coin, or of possessing counterfeit gold or silver coin, or the offence of obtaining goods or money by false pretenses or the offence of conspiracy to defraud, or any misdemeanour under the 58th section of the Larceny Act, 1861. Scotland for the purpose of section 243 of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act 1992, a crime means an offence punishable on indictment, or an offence punishable on summary conviction, and for the commission of which the offender is liable under the statute making the offence punishable to be imprisoned either absolutely or at the discretion of the court as an alternative for some other punishment. Sociology A normative definition views crime as deviant behavior that violates prevailing norms, cultural standards prescribing how humans ought to behave normally. This approach considers the complex realities surrounding the concept of crime and seeks to understand how changing social, political, psychological, and economic conditions may affect changing definitions of crime in the form of the legal, law enforcement, and penal responses made by society. These structural realities remain fluid and often contentious. For example, as cultures change and the political environment shifts, societies may criminalize or decriminalize certain behaviors, which directly affects the statistical crime rates, influence the allocation of resources for the enforcement of laws, and influence the general public opinion. Similarly, Changes in the collection and or calculation of data on crime may affect the public perceptions of the extent of any given crime problem. All such adjustments to crime statistics, allied with the experience of people in their everyday lives, shape attitudes on the extent to which the state should use law or social engineering to enforce or encourage any particular social norm. Behavior can be controlled and influenced by a society in many ways without having to resort to the criminal justice system. Indeed, in those cases where no clear consensus exists on a given norm, the drafting of criminal law by the group in power to prohibit the behavior of another group may seem to some observers an improper limitation of the second group's freedom, and the ordinary members of society have less respect for the law or laws in general, whether the authorities actually enforce the disputed law or not. Other definitions legislatures can pass laws that define crimes against social norms. These laws vary from time to time and from place to place. Note variations in gambling laws, for example, and the prohibition or encouragement of dueling in history. Other crimes, called malar in Shay, count as outlawed in almost all societies. English criminal law and the related criminal law of Commonwealth countries can define offences that the courts alone have developed over the years, without any actual legislation. Common law offences. The courts used the concept of malim in Shea to develop various common law offences. Criminalization. One can view criminalization as a procedure deployed by society as a preemptive harm reduction device, using the threat of punishment as a deterrent to anyone proposing to engage in the behavior causing harm. The state becomes involved because governing entities can become convinced that the costs of not criminalizing outweigh the costs of criminalizing. It, 
criminalization may provide future harm reduction at least to the outside population, assuming those shamed or incarcerated or otherwise restrained for committing crimes start out more prone to criminal behavior. Likewise, one might assume that criminalizing acts that in themselves do not harm other people may prevent subsequent harmful acts. Some see the criminalization of victimless crimes as a pretext for imposing personal, religious or moral convictions on otherwise productive citizens or taxpayers. Some commentators may see criminalization as a way to make potential criminals pay or suffer for their prospective crimes. In this case, criminalization becomes a way to set the price that one must pay to society for certain actions considered detrimental to society as a whole. An extreme view might see criminalization as state-sanctioned revenge. States control the process of criminalization because the enforcers formally appointed by the state often have better access to expertise and resources. The victims may only want compensation for the injuries suffered, while remaining indifferent to a possible desire for deterrence. Fear of retaliation may deter victims or witnesses of crimes from taking any action. Even in police societies, fear may inhibit from reporting incidents or from cooperating in a trial. Victims, on their own, may lack the economies of scale that could allow them to administer a penal system, let alone to collect any fines levied by a court. Garupa and Clermin warn that a rent-seeking government has as its primary motivation to maximize revenue and so, if offenders have sufficient wealth, a rent-seeking government will act more aggressively than a social welfare maximizing government in enforcing laws against minor crimes, but more laxly in enforcing laws against major crimes. As a result of the crime, victims may die or become incapacitated. Labeling Theory the label of crime and the accompanying social stigma normally confine their scope to those activities seen as injurious to the general population or to the state, including some that cause serious loss or damage to individuals. Those who apply the labels of crime or criminal intend to assert the hegemony of a dominant population or to reflect a consensus of condemnation for the identified behavior and to justify any punishments prescribed by the state. Natural law theory, justifying the state's use of force to coerce compliance with its laws has proven a consistent theoretical problem. One of the earliest justifications involved the theory of natural law. This posits that the nature of the world or of human beings underlies the standards of morality or constructs them. Thomas Aquinas wrote in the 13th century, The rule and measure of human acts is the reason, which is the first principle of human acts. He regarded people as by nature rational beings, concluding that it becomes morally appropriate that they should behave in a way that conforms to their rational nature. Thus, to be valid, any law must conform to natural law and coercing people to conform to that law is morally acceptable. In the 1760s William Blackstone described the thesis, this law of nature, being coeval with mankind and dictated by God himself, is of course superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over all the globe, in all countries, and at all times. No human laws are of any validity, if contrary to this, and such of them as are valid derive all their force, and all their authority, immediately or immediately, from this original. But John Austin, an early positivist, applied utilitarianism in accepting the calculating nature of human beings and the existence of an objective morality. He denied that the legal validity of a norm depends on whether its content conforms to morality. Thus in Austinian terms a moral code can objectively determine what people ought to do. The law can embody whatever norms the legislature decrees to achieve social utility, but every individual remains free to choose what to do. Similarly, Hart saw the law as an aspect of sovereignty, with lawmakers able to adopt any law as a means to a moral end. Thus the necessary and sufficient conditions for the truth of a proposition of law simply involved internal logic and consistency. 
and that the state's agents use state power with responsibility. Ronald Dworkin rejects Hart's theory and proposes that all individuals should expect the equal respect and concern of those who govern them as a fundamental political right. He offers a theory of compliance overlaid by a theory of deference and a theory of enforcement, which identifies the legitimate goals of enforcement and punishment. Legislation must conform to a theory of legitimacy, which describes the circumstances under which a particular person or group is entitled to make law, and a theory of legislative justice, which describes the law they are entitled or obliged to make. Indeed, despite everything, the majority of natural law theorists have accepted the idea of enforcing the prevailing morality as a primary function of the law. This view entails the problem that it makes any moral criticism of the law impossible. If conformity with natural law forms a necessary condition for legal validity, all valid law must, by definition, count as morally just. Thus, on this line of reasoning, the legal validity of a norm necessarily entails its moral justice. One can solve this problem by granting some degree of moral relativism and accepting that norms may evolve over time in, therefore, one can criticize the continued enforcement of old laws in the light of the current norms. People may find such law acceptable, but the use of state power to coerce citizens to comply with that law lacks moral justification. More recent conceptions of the theory characterize crime as the violation of individual rights. Since society considers so many rights as natural rather than man-made, what constitutes a crime also counts as natural, in contrast to laws. Adam Smith illustrates this view, saying that a smuggler would be an excellent citizen. Dot had not the laws of his country made that a crime which nature never meant to be so. Natural law theory therefore distinguishes between criminality and illegality. Lawyers sometimes express the two concepts with the phrases malum in she and malum prohibitum respectively. They regard of crime malum in she as inherently criminal, whereas of crime malum prohibitum counts as criminal only because the law has decreed it. So, it follows from this view that one can perform an illegal act without committing a crime, while a criminal act could be perfectly legal. Many Enlightenment thinkers subscribe to this view to some extent, and it remains influential among so-called classical liberals and libertarians.